They used to be called the king of the forest because they were the tallest tree. One chestnut tree could easily build um, a large barn and a home. And there used to be this old saying that chestnut could take you from cradle to grave. The tree was really important in the Appalachian forest from an ecological point of view. I mean, it almost defined the southern Appalachian forest. It may have comprised as much as 10 to 25 percent of the forest canopy. The health of the Appalachian forest will never be restored until we put the American chestnut back. It was a crop and a tradition. Homes were built from it, and people were fed by it. And the American chestnut tree would fall victim to people who prized it. The curator of the Bronx Zoo in New York is the one that gets the bad rap for bringing the blight here. But back in the 19th century, the early 1900s, people were importing plants from all over the place. It was kind of the in vogue thing to start arboretums and have tree examples from all over the world. And so at the time, he brought in um, several uh, Chinese chestnut trees to plant in the arboretum at the zoo. They were very healthy looking, but apparently they carried the blight in their bark and our American chestnut trees had absolutely no immunity to them at all. And that happened in 1907 where they imported those trees. And by 1912, every tree in New York was dead. Then the blight spread all the way down the range. It hit Ohio probably in the early 1950s is when most of our trees died. The outcome was that the American chestnut was essentially removed from the forest. There are still hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of American chestnut sprouts in the forest that keep coming up, they get blight, die down, because the blight doesn't kill the roots, it only kills the above ground parts. So we still have kind of a smoldering existence of the species, but they don't serve the ecological or economic role that they did before the blight. But in one part of northeastern Ohio, the chestnut has made a comeback. There were lots of remnants of American chestnuts, some dead, some alive, but mostly impressive trees. And that was what I kind of fell in love with as a kid. But as I got older and, and wanted to come back home, I needed to figure out some way to make money. So the idea was, well, maybe I could grow chestnuts as a crop and sell that. We grow Chinese chestnuts for several reasons. One, they're blight resistant. Two, they produce uh, really good tasting nuts that are large size, and, uh, and they're adapted to the climate that we have here. We harvest by hand. Chestnuts are born in these real spiny burrs. They're very sharp, the needles are sharper than a sewing needle and uh, penetrate skin, fortunately not very deeply, before they break off. And what's inside, though, are usually two or three, you know, of the nuts that we call chestnuts. And when the chestnuts ripen, the burr opens up, and most of the chestnuts fall out, and we can just pick them up loose. Sometimes the burr falls off with the chestnuts still in it, and then you gotta step on the burr or open it up with a gloved hand and get the contents out. It's not as difficult as it might look, but uh, we get pickers who get pretty adept at it. We pay pickers to pick up. Uh, we probably will have maybe 100 people working this year, anywhere from a few hours to you know every day for a few hours uh, during the three-week harvest. 
And uh, we advertise that chestnuts are just like pennies. We pay $10 to fill a five-gallon bucket, and there's about 1,000 nuts, so that's a 1,000 pennies. So I say, well, it's just like I've just scattered a million pennies on the ground, and anybody who wants to come pick them up can have them. So all we do is pay people to put nuts in the bucket, and from then on, it gets a lot easier once they're in the bucket. Yet, while Greg's Chinese chestnuts thrive, the Native American chestnut tree is making a slow but steady comeback. The Chinese chestnut tree is fairly squatty, kind of like an apple type tree. It doesn't get real tall, has rounded shape to it. And so you plant trees out in the woods like that and they're immediately overshadowed by the oaks and the maples and the hickories and all those kinds of things. And so they're, they, they never grew back into a timber tree. Ever since the chestnut blight arrived, people have been trying to somehow restore or save the American chestnut. And I think the, the biggest effort at the moment uh, is that being carried out by the American Chestnut Foundation, which began in 1983. But what took only a few years to wipe out has taken generations of careful crossbreeding to restore. And through this process, the Chinese chestnuts, which brought the blight originally, have become the key to overcoming it. The Chestnut Foundation located the pure Americans that were left, tried to find ones that seemed to exhibit some kind of blight resistance. And they collected nuts from those trees, grew them up into orchards. Then they crossbred them with Chinese chestnuts that seemed to have a more timber quality to them and uh, seemed to be very blight resistant. And that was the first generation. And then they bred those back to the pure Americans again. The trees that we are now producing um, are 94% pure American. They look like American. It's, it's almost impossible for me to tell one of these trees from a pure American tree. Are they gonna be a canopy tree like they're supposed to be? We just don't really know. It's all a big ex experiment. I first heard about the American chestnut when I was a graduate student at Ohio University. And I heard about how we had this beautiful tree that I had never seen. And then this fungus came in and killed them all. And I thought, well, if I could ever get into the position of doing something, I would try to help. The fungus was man-made. We brought it here. We introduced it. We killed these trees. And so the opportunity to bring back a tree almost from extinction, I think, is, is a really exciting prospect.